welcome to the Burden and Blessing Podcast, a study and discussion forum on the truth of God's Word. Our CPR series looks at certain topics that come up in life, and we attempt to discuss them in a way that relates to everyone. At times, we bring in the arguments of those opposed to the Word of God in order to practice contending for the faith that God gave His church. It is our prayer that you will be equipped to give a defense for the truths of the Christian faith with humility and respect. Glad to have you with us at Burden Blessing this morning. We're getting back into our study of different religions in the world. We're taking a look at a group that might not be real familiar to many people. It might be a name that you've heard, at least in passing or in discussion, but may be a little bit perplexed about what that actually refers to, what the group is is describing. Joining us to talk about the religious nuns, and that's not N-U-N, but N-O-N-E-S, is Mark Tiefel. How are you, Mark? Good, Nathaniel. Might be a little more enjoyable to talk about the NUN nuns, but not what we're looking at today. Yeah, we did have a we did have an interesting conversation the other day when we were talking about discussing religious nuns, and somebody said, "Hey, I didn't know we could talk about them." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are they a group of their own? <laughs> right. So this is a this is a growing group. There's it's getting a lot more publicity here in in statistics and research and all kinds of things today. But there might be some people out there that still they've heard the name, but they don't know exactly who they are. Who are the religious nuns? Well, you you get a good idea of what they're all about with their name, religious n o n e nun, which means. Uh, they, they, they identify themselves that way because they don't believe in any particular religious belief. They don't they, – they would not associate themselves with any particular religious belief. And that may sound uh, kind of like atheist or agnostic to us, but uh, they actually – religious nuns would actually even care – uh, categorize atheists and agnostics as a separate group as well. So they, they even want to differentiate themselves uh, in their identification from those groups. Uh, we're going to talk about how really um, atheists, agnostics, religious nuns, they all end up in the same place when it comes to what their beliefs are, but how they view themselves is different. And so um, w- w- we recognize them as a different group. Um, and And what, the reason that we're we're talking about this and the reason that it comes up is because, uh, you know, most of us are aware that in America, it seems like things are growing more secular. People are are trending away from Christianity more, and yet the the actual percentages and numbers for atheism and agnosticism are remaining pretty low. So where is this all coming from? Well, I think when you look at the religious nun group, you see where this growth in secularism is coming from. Um, in a study, a research study from 2007 to 2014, there was a jump from 16% that identified themselves as religious nuns in 2007 to 23% in 2014. And the largest category within that group um, would be people who would call themselves religious nuns in addition to atheists and agnostics. And so it is a growing movement, growing much faster than those who would call themselves atheist or agnostic. So let's let's just stop for just a minute and talk a little bit about that number because that's a pretty big number. What you're talking about is basically a quarter of the population is describing themselves as being religiously unaffiliated. Is that correct? Correct. And and again within that within that twenty three percent of U.S. adults would be the atheist and agnostic designation, but that's the that's a much smaller percentage within that group than the religious nuns are. So one of the numbers that I've seen for for those that would identify as being atheist is about three percent, and that's a, that's growing too. It was 1.6 percent if I remember in 2006 or 2007. It's grown to three percent, but that still remains 20 percent that would either be they recognize that there is a God, but they don't know who that God is, or they say, I'm not really sure, the, the, uh, the agnostic. Uh, that's, that's a huge percentage of people, and that is rapidly growing also according to what we're looking at right now. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's what makes it difficult to pin down too because um, – 
atheists are usually pretty clear about not having any association with God. This group of what, you know, whether you want to say agnostics or religious nuns, it's some type of blending of God, but not associating with any particular religion or any particular God, but having some sort of element of God in there. So it's kind of hard within that 20% to really narrow down what a person believes because it can differ so radically in, in what a person, that's part of what it's, what it, how we got to where we're at is personal choice, you know, deciding for yourselves what types of things you'd like to have that God offers and, and kind of picking and choosing in that way. It's very subjective. So let me, let me throw out another number to you. In the 1700s, back when our country was founded, there are statistics that say that 75 to 80 percent of the American population in the, in the 1700s went to church. 80 percent of the population went to church. Now we're looking at a number that's the exact opposite. We're looking at between 20 and 25 percent of the population that says that they go to church on a regular basis. Now that's a huge shift in the last 300 years in our country. And this, this fits into that, doesn't it? I guess what I'm wondering is, is that 23% really accurate or is it actually bigger than that? Oh, yeah. I think it, I think it very well could be bigger than that. I mean, this is, we're, we're going off of a research study from, uh, 20, 2014. But that's, first of all, that's only tapping into a segment of the population. And second of all, you're not going to be able to, you know, religion is a private thing for a lot of people. So not everybody is going to be very upfront about exactly how they feel. So yeah, I think there could definitely be some some additional percentage points that could be put onto that when we're actually looking at what's happening in reality. A lot of this is, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of this is an outgrowth of where we are in our society today. It's an outgrowth of multiculturalism, pluralism, relativism of the, the modern world that we live in, where people want to believe whatever they want to believe. You can't pigeonhole people into this particular group. And that's kind of what they want, isn't it? That they don't they don't want to be pigeonholed into a particular denomination or church group or even religion in general. These are the people that are saying, hey, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious in essence. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you look at the the study also determined what segments of the population fit into this designation of religious none the most and the the largest segment 36 percent uh, are younger millennials which would be those born 1990 and after and then it goes down to you know essentially follows the years the years in which people were born there but i think in a hallmark of millennials is that they want their own identity and they want freedom to reign, meaning that they don't want other people to put regulations or limitations or commands on what they have to believe or how they have to live. They they have grown up in the culture of pluralism in America more than any other culture. I mean, it's it's we know it's been there. It's been there from from the beginning of America in some way, but they they have just been thoroughly indoctrinated into it. And that goes hand in hand with with one of their core beliefs as a segment of the population is don't try to harness my beliefs into one category. And so they look at religious systems as archaic, as irrelevant, outdated, and and kind of hampering to what real personal development is. And so you see this now reflected in how they express themselves about God. I think there's a good, a good segment of them that's not ready to give up on God. They see a value to religion. They see a value to God. We all know the Bible says it very clearly. We all sense the presence of God through the natural knowledge. So they haven't denied that. And one of the other hallmarks of millennials is they have a very strong desire to do good, a very, you know, a, a, a strong sense of cultural and social justice. And so they see God as valuable there. But as far as directing my life as to how to live or what to do, not so much. And so you see, I think that's where we see the, the reflection here of the growth and this sort of, uh, sort of grab bag of what this religion really means. I mean, it's really up to the individual to decide what a religious nun is. It can it can differ so radically across across segments of the population. So in in that 
in that particular point right there is what distinguishes or what really makes the religious nuns different from all of the other religions that we've talked about that have an actual set of beliefs. You can actually go to some book that says, here's what we believe. There is nothing like that when it comes to the relig religious nuns, is there? No, nothing, nothing. And, and then that's part of it is people will adopt what they want from different religions. So that, you know, well, I see some value here from Christianity. I see some value from Islam, Buddha, Eastern meditation. They see some value. You know, it's 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 the actualization of pluralism, if you will, in, a, in our culture where we're, we're literally taking little elements from each religion and using them how we see them as best. It seems like we've ta touched on just a little bit here the – What's what's the motivation behind this – the growth of this movement in our society? One of the other things that, that that survey that you were just referring to pointed out is statistics regarding the either increase or decrease in in religious commitment. And it was striking in that to see that across all generations, in every category, there was a – a decrease in those that would say that they had a high religious commitment and a increase in those who would say that they have a very low religious commitment. Now, like you were talking about the millennials, those numbers were a lot higher. Mm -hmm. uh, they had – there were bigger percentages that said uh, we are we are no longer have a high level of commitment and a higher percentage of those who said we, we now have a lower level of commitment. But it is interesting that in every one of those age groups across the board – there is a an overall decrease in those who have a high level of commitment to religion and, a, and an increase in those who have a low level. Is that part of what is developing or prompting the religious nuns? Is this this general uh, departation from just Christianity and religion in general? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think the Christian religion is one that's built on commitment. It's it's first and foremost God's commitment to us. You know, you look at the Bible. The two divisions of the Bible, as far as as far as the the uh, content of it, Old Testament, New Testament. A testament is a covenant. It's a commitment. It, it, it's we call our Bible Old Testament, New Testament because of the commitment of God that it centers around the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And so that is that idea of commitment is so fundamental to what the Christian faith is all about. You think of then applying that to marriage. As an example, where God God makes the parallel in Ephesians five of His commitment to us as believers and our our following of Him parallel to that of husband and wife in a marriage, haven't we seen the departure of commitment in marriage in our culture for a long time since right. the nineteen sixties ushered in the sexual revolution, which led to the departing from that commitment stance, and so. What we're seeing is what what God God meant what He said. You know these things mirror each other in our lives, and and when we when we leave commitments in lesser areas of our lives, it's going to reflect back on how we view God and how committed we might be to His Word, or or how 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 valuable we see that commitment being. You know the strength of a Christian is not how committed per se they are; it's what God does for them. But how you see the value of that aspect of your faith. Is very very important to your your relationship with God. Is commitment an important thing? You know, putting my foot down in the sand and saying, "No, I will not give up on these elements of what God tells me in His Word," because that is very very important to my faith. That's where commitment comes in, and and you and we certainly are not seeing that. And like you mentioned, it's good to point out this is not just a problem with younger millennials either. We're we're seeing the higher percentages reflected on, among among all demographics. In America, it's just that the largest numbers are with millennials, and, it, and that certainly fits with other aspects of millennial belief. If you were to take a look at our culture, our society today, what do you think is driving this? Is this partially a result of the the secularization of our education that we are inculcating this? There, there do also seem to be higher numbers among those that are highly educated that have gone through all of the educational branches and, and get high degrees. Those There's a higher percentage of those that would consider themselves to be religious nuns because of the education. Is it related to education? Is it because of affluence? Is it a little bit of both? You know, I would gravitate more toward the education aspect of it rather than I, I certainly think both are at play i think that 
um, affluence. You know, Jesus tells us it's 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 easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, uh, be on guard against the love of money, for the love of money is the root of all evil. We know affluence can be a problem for our faith, but America has been essentially the most affluent nation for well over 100 100 to 200 years i mean we've been we've been affluent for a while but we haven't seen these trends increase so i think there's more at play than just that i think the education aspect is important and in in two i think you hit on the two senses of how that's important first of all the education system in america is pushing these pluralistic secular beliefs even about god we hear the public school saying all the time, oh, we're keeping God out of the school. Well, you're not really right. because you're you're not maybe not using the name God or using any particular religious book, but you're teaching young people how to view God, right? whether or not you want to admit it. And, and, and what's being taught in our schools, in our public schools, definitely reflects that. But I think the other aspect of it, too, that you touched on with education is the wiser you get, the less need you have for God. And, and we see God warning about that all the time in his word of, I mean, read through the book of Proverbs, <laughs> God talking all the time about wisdom is found in the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise the Lord who, you know, Proverbs 13, 13, whoever despises the word brings destruction upon himself, you know, and who, who wrote the book of Proverbs to our, to the best of our knowledge, Solomon, the wisest person in the world. Uh, we just had this section in a Bible study from Colossians 2, where Paul says in verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. There is a danger when it comes to education, even for the even even the proper kinds of education, because the wiser you get, the more temptation there is to drift away from what God says, because our faith with God is really a faith that's built around need. We need a savior. We are in sin. We have a problem. And if you don't believe you got those issues up front, then that's going to affect what you believe about God. That's going to affect what you think your relationship is to that savior. Well, if I can, I can conquer my problems in this world through being high, higher educated. Um, that's that's the the philosophy of the world around us. God warns about that because that's going to make you think. Well, I might need my Savior to show me an example, but I don't necessarily need him to pay for my sins. You know, I might need my Savior to to you know make me feel good about myself when I'm feeling down, but I don't need him to direct my life through his word. I don't need to actually obey him. That is a very dangerous, a very slippery slope, and I think that comes about the wiser we get, the more tendency there is for us to forget about that need that we have. Um, and, and that's really a very important aspect of our culture today is the reliance on human wisdom. You know, we see it in politics. Um, we see it just in, in personal conversations that so many people have the attitude of, well, if we just educate ourselves better, it'll solve the world's problems. That's not that's not going to be the case. It kind of reminds me of what the Apostle Paul writes too. You mentioned those those verses in Colossians, which I think are so appropriate. Paul even warns about that. He says there there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. When we focus on the things of this life, like you said, we get to the point where we realize or we think we don't need God anymore. We can solve all of our problems on our own. We can we can fix humanity by ourselves. We don't we don't need a god to do that. With with all of this, there is a silver lining. And I think that's found in what you mentioned at the very beginning that if you take out those that 3% which are atheists, for the most part these people that don't have any religious affiliation, they do recognize that God is there. They are in a sense seeking or at least they're open because they don't have an actual set of beliefs that is consistent, can you give us some direction as to how we can, as Christians, we can reach out to the religious nuns? How can we help them and lead them to see that the real hope that they have is in the person of Jesus? How can we help them to see that? Well, one section that I think of is we've got examples of religious nuns in the Bible, too. 
Sure. And so I think of a section about that. Go to, you know, you go to Acts 17 where Paul addresses the Athenians. Remember, they had the altar to the unknown God. You know, the, and, and we, you know, the Athenian approach is a little bit different than our culture today in America. You know, they believed in, in pretty solid concepts of justice and truth and morality. But just in case they were missing anything in their plurality of gods, they put out this altar to, well, let's just cover all our bases just in case there's some god out there that we don't know. Uh, and Paul really was able to get the gospel through to them. Um, by, we're, we're told that he reasoned with them, that he talked to them about the, the inconsistencies there, but he also preached Jesus and the resurrection to them. And, and the verses that I really like to get down to in Acts 17 come right at the end where Paul's addressing the, the greater multitude of, of the, the people of Athens there. And he says, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has appointed. And then he's given assurance of this by raising him from the dead. What Paul does at the very end there is exactly what I think religious nuns need, and that is to get specific about God. That's the whole problem within this religious movement is they want to water things down to incorporate whatever they feel like and whatever they want to believe and to be, you know, probably to be inclusive to all different cultures and religions and whatnot. Paul says there is a day that the world is going to be judged by the man who rose from the dead. That is very specific, and that is the only thing, frankly, that's going to fill in this pressing need that we have about God, this hollow feeling in our hearts that we have because of our sin where we're groping, if you will, like Paul said in another section, we're searching out to try to find God. That's the only answer that's really going to satisfy us and fulfill us. And I think that Paul touches on another aspect that really goes along with this movement, and that is the fear of ignorance. That is a big thing. We talked about the insistence on education and human wisdom. That's because there's a great fear in our world today of being found ignorant. People want to be found enlightened or educated. And Paul says these times of ignorance, God has overlooked. You know, we're, whether or not we want to admit it, because of our sin, we all start out at, at a position of ignorance. That is the truth. And Paul says, God, God has been patient with us up to this point on that, but there's a day coming that we need to be ready for and be prepared for. And so I think sections like that can, can resonate because it does give solid answers to some of those questions that the religious nuns face. With that Acts 17 section, it is interesting to see the parallels between our world today and the world then, you, you, we talked about pluralism being one of the foundational reasons for this, and we see that very much in, in Acts chapter 17. But what I found, found interesting in your response there, Mark, is that what you're saying is that we need to talk to these people who are inclusive by giving them the exclusive message of Christianity. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you look when we look at the statistics in 2018, they took this data from 2014 and asked, OK, why do religious nuns feel this way? What's prompting them to to associate their beliefs like this? And the number one reason across the board from atheist to agnostic to none was questioning the religious teaching. And isn't that exactly what Satan wants to do? is to question the objective truth about what God has said to us and, and get that as the first pillar that falls. Because then at that point, what you're doing, even you, you may still care about morality. You may still want to do good in life. You may still want to associate with God in some way, but you're going to do it on your terms. You're going to lose that objective basis of what God has said in his word. And, and it's going to, it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a mosh pit at that point where we're all wrestling around with each, with each other and what to believe and what to say. And that, that, that is a product of what we're in right now. Millennials, we talked about, they have a strong sense of social justice. They want to do what is right. I just preached a sermon a couple months ago where I talked about the, a news article where a guy came out and said that he thought it was more sinful to not recycle than to 
do harm to others, do harms to other humans. Right. That's the that's the world we're living in. That's how people feel very, very strongly and convicted about moral causes. The problem is when you go back to why do you feel that way? Nobody can really say why. We have strong moral convictions still, but we're losing the objective base about why we feel that way. Right. And that's the teaching of God's word. Right. That's God's word to us. That is our foundation. That is our source. And so I think there's a place there that we can re we can bring that message in to, to individuals who would identify this way, but you have to get them back to something specific. The specifics of the Christian foundation, I think, is exactly what they need, which is ironic, like right. you said, because it's exactly what they're doubting, too. But that is exactly what Paul did in Acts 17. Mm -hmm. He dealt with the inclusive culture of Greece with the exclusive message of Christianity. He spoke about the death and the resurrection of Jesus, and that was what they needed to hear. We don't know how yeah. many people were brought to faith out of out of that, yeah. but that is the solution for the problem that we face in this world. Yeah, and I think I think if you if we step up and do that, what we'll find is that a lot of people who identify as religious none, they don't even know what the Bible says. Right. right. Because the, because a lot of people have been led astray from from early on, either being in a church that never used the Bible or associating Christianity outside of its teachings. But it it, it can be very very eye opening for a person to see that. Jesus himself was not inclusive. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Jesus was was very took very very definitive lines on right and wrong, uh, and so most people have a completely different image in their mind, and so they're starting from a from a completely different point. I don't think that the typical religious nun that we're going to come into contact with is going to be militant about their faith and really really hardened in what they believe. There are opportunities there. It, you could just be interacting with somebody who doesn't really know any better, who's just been led astray. Well, I think, we, again, we kind of go back to just that, that hope that is there, that we do have an opportunity. This is not new, like you, you pointed out. This is something that has been around since the very, very beginning. As human beings, we don't want to be subjected to God, uh, to be dependent on God, to have to, to, to deal with him. But that's exactly what you said. We need that and bringing that realization to those that are of the nuns or of you know whatever other religious group it is that we're talking about. That's the hope that we have. And it's not to try to hide the truth, but to reveal the truth because it's through that truth that the Holy Spirit does his work. Yeah, and, and we mentioned Acts 17. There are many other sections of scripture that can fit into this category. You know, even for well-seasoned, strong Christians, I'd, I'd encourage you, go into your Bibles, read a section of your Bible, and, and read it from this mindset of what we've been talking about. Think think about this issue about religious nuns that our culture is facing, and read your section of Scripture and say, how does that address that? I think you'll find it. there are many specific passages, stories, instances in the Bible that talk about this very thing. Because although it's a new thing to us in in American culture, this is an this goes back to the human flesh that we all have had, that we all struggle with, that has been there from the beginning of sin, and so we'll see those we'll see it reflected in the people of the Bible as well. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking us through that, Mark. This is a very current situation. We see the growth of it. I think it's important for people to understand who the nuns are, what they are, and most importantly, to, to recognize there is hope that we, we as Christians do have an opportunity with those religious nuns when we run into them. We need to, to point them back to the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the fact that he's the one, the one solution to the problem that we have. We encourage you to take a look at our website, Burden Blessing. Org. We have all of the podcasts that we have that are posted on there, as well as articles and other content that we'd encourage you to take a look at, share that with others as well. If you do have any questions or if you have any thoughts about things that you'd like to have us discuss in the future, please send us an email also at burdenandblessing at gmail.com. We'll take a look at that and uh, try to get that included in our schedule. Thanks for joining us today, and may the Lord richly bless you all. We hope that you will join us next week for another episode of Burden and Blessing Podcast. Our goal is always to bring you the whole counsel of God. Until next time, go in the strength of the Lord and preach the word.